morning. Welcome to our Sunday School Hour, and uh, I'm glad that you've joined us uh, this morning. A uh, little different setup here. Uh, I'm in my office because my sanctuary setup is no longer now that we were, me we're meeting on Sunday mornings. And so um, I trust that you're ready to explore the rest of Chapter 8 here. Um, it's good. It's good stuff, and uh, I think that um, there's benefit in it for, for all of us. And so why don't we pause, uh, we'll quiet our hearts with prayer, and ask God to speak to our hearts. Lord, thank you for uh, another wonderful opportunity to explore the truth of your word. Lord, we understand, as we have been shown throughout this study, that your purpose is transformation in our lives. And uh, so I pray, Lord, that through what we see this morning, um, our hearts would be transformed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, open our hearts and minds to your truth and remove distractions, remove um, misunderstandings, uh, remove, Lord, those heart desires that are in conflict with your truth. Lord, we want you to do your work. We might be more like Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. We are, as I said, in chapter 8. Uh, almost halfway through is where we uh, left off last week. And so if you, you recall, uh, we ended last week with uh, a chart. Um, now, uh, you can see on the chart that we are we're talking about uh, disciplines of wisdom. Um, how does a person receive God's wisdom? Now, the, um, the, the section of the book that we are in is called Renewing Our Mind. All right? And that's the work of God in the process of transformation in our lives. He has to renew our minds. We'll explore this more in the morning message. Um, but we're talking here in regard to renewing our mind. We're talking about wisdom. Chapter eight is called seeking for wisdom. And so we're dealing here, um, in regard to how wisdom comes, what are the disciplines of wisdom? Okay. If you recall last week, just by way of review, uh, we talked about wisdom and the correlation between the Old Testament idea of wisdom and the likeness, uh, or I should say Christ-likeness in our lives. And so we found wisdom, uh, what it was, um, and we talked about two different views. We talked about the view from the helicopter and the view from the dashboard. Wisdom for you and I is the view from the dashboard. It's what gives us the understanding of how we are to respond to what comes our way in life. And so we're talking about the path to wisdom at the end of last lesson. And we talked about the twin disciplines of hearing and doing. All right. And we showed you the chart at the end of last chapter or the last lesson. And so let's take a quick look at that. We see the master disciplines of, sorry about that. The master disciplines are hearing and doing. And then uh, below each one, you have sub-disciplines or basic disciplines of each one. Of course, hearing and doing comes from uh, James uh, chapter 1. Be hearers of the word and uh, be doers of the word and not hearers only. And so those two disciplines are vital in gaining God's wisdom. Um, we'll talk about in the rest of this chapter the basic discipline uh, of the master discipline of, of hearing. And we'll talk about attention and meditation. And so let's dig in here. We're talking about the master discipline of hearing. One of the first parables that our Lord told focused on the importance of hearing. Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 21. 
Um, and he set forth there what we call the parable of the sower, uh, or what is more accurately called the parable of the soil. And in that parable, Christ told how a farmer spreading seed on the ground could expect various results depending on the condition of the soil. Only one kind of soil was truly productive and bore fruit. In the parable, he sets forth four, sorry, I'm trying to get my hand here in front of the camera, four uh, types of soil that represented four types of hearers of the word of God. But only one of those types of soil, only one of those types of hearers was productive and bore fruit. So let's look at each of those types of hearer represented by different types of soil. And we begin here with the indifferent hearer. Remember the soil of the wayside? Some fell by the wayside. Well, that was the footpath that borders the field. It's been packed hard because of constant traffic and frequent rains. And the seed is left exposed to the birds that quickly devour it. Now, this represents a man's heart that is totally unreceptive to truth. Somebody who is indifferent to truth. This kind of soil or this kind of heart bears no fruit. And so it's useless. That kind of soil is useless to the farmer. That kind of, that kind of heart is useless to God. So we see the indifferent here. But I'd like you to notice, secondly, the impulsive hearer. The soil in this part of the field is shallow because of underlying bedrock. The heat of the sun quickly bakes the seed and it doesn't bring forth any fruit. This uh, soil represents a heart that is emotional and insincere. This man doesn't count the cost of receiving the word. He's unwilling to pay the price. Initially, he may seem open and receptive to the word of God, but the tests of life reveal that the seed has not taken root in his heart. His reaction is, all that sounds good to me, but not if I have to fill in the blank, right? And so an underlying bedrock of stubbornness keeps God's word from deeply penetrating the soil of his heart. This ground, too, is basically useless to the farmer because it bears no lasting fruit. And thus this kind of heart is basically useless to God because in just a matter of time, it's obvious, it's revealed that there is a stubbornness that will keep the root, uh, keep the the word of God from taking root in that heart. And so we see the indifferent here. We see the impulsive hearer. Notice with me the third, which is the infested hearer. Fruit does not grow well in the soil either because it is infested with weeds. Uh, because, excuse me, let me back that up. Fruit does not grow well in the soil, either because it is infested with weeds that grow out the seed, that, that crowd out the seed. Sorry about that. This person seems receptive to the word, but is unwilling to weed out the distractions that consume his life. Things like anxieties, uh, riches, pleasures. These are things that that, uh, that that take the seed and strangle it, choke it to death. And so like the previous seed, it's almost useless to the farmer. Uh, excuse me, like the previous soil, it's almost useless to the farmer because its yield is almost non-existent. It will produce very little fruit. And so the infested hearer is one who whose heart and mind is consumed with all kinds of other things, uh, the cares of the world that keep the seed of God's word from taking real root in the heart. Lastly, we see in this parable the ideal hearer. And this is, the, this is represented by the good soil. 
The good soil receives the seed and produces what Luke calls an hundredfold. In other words, the fruit is multiplied. That one seed produces multiple fruit or manifold fruit. This is the heart that hears the word of God and keeps it or is a doer, an obeyer of the word. Jesus said it is honest and good. Good here doesn't mean morally good, but rather free from defects. It's a heart that has not let anything crowd out or hinder the, grow, the growth of the seed of the word. These are the Marys who sit at Jesus' feet, or the Corneliuses who wish to hear all things that are commanded, and the Bereans who, Paul said, received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily. This kind of soil keeps the word. This heart goes to whatever extent necessary to nurture the seed to fruit-bearing maturity. And this kind of soil is truly useful to the farmer. And so here in this parable, Jesus admonished the audience. He says, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And then a few verses later, he says, take heed therefore how ye hear. Notice that he places the main responsibility for fruitfulness on the condition of the soil. <clears throat> the sower here, <clears throat> excuse me, the sower here, speaking of Christ, always does his part. The seed is always of the highest quality. And so what doesn't change is the sower or the seed. But what has to change is the condition of the soil. Hearing in the scriptures always means more than just auditory reception. It describes a high quality <clears throat> of attention and retention. Okay, Remember, the soil in the parable refers to the heart, what's inside. And so hearing goes far deeper than just the ears. It goes to the heart. So it's fitting that the book of Proverbs would open with a statement, a wise man will hear. So what does it mean to hear? Well, let's dig into that a little bit. We're going to talk about the basic discipline of, uh, of attention. Biblically, hearing means, first of all, that we are choosing to listen to God. As we said earlier, wisdom is found in the context of a relationship with Christ. Biblical wisdom is always tied to my relationship with Christ. His words are not the words of a fellow man. They cannot be ignored or disobeyed with, without seriously changing the relationship of the believer with the speaker of the words. Most of us find our mailboxes cluttered with, with junk mail uh, these days. It's annoying, isn't it? And even with the invention of email, where we can receive information uh, through electronic means rather than physical means, we still get junk mail, don't we? It's not uncommon for us to receive junk phone calls as well most often in the most inopportune of times. We get barraged with cyber junk mail, advertising. Somebody's always trying to persuade us to buy something. But imagine for a moment that you received an oversized envelope in the mail soliciting your subscription to a national news magazine. Like most of us, you open the envelope Briefly scan the offer and throw the thing into the trash can. As far as you're concerned, your actions are appropriate because you have decided that you do not need that particular magazine. You don't for a moment imagine that four weeks later an executive in the magazine's publishing headquarters is going to be distraught 
as he ponders, I sent one of those packets to John Bickle. An entire month has gone by without a response from him. I wonder what I did wrong. Did I offend him in some way? Why would he ignore me like this? Why hasn't he responded yet? <laughs> that, of course, is ludicrous. We don't expect any publishing executive to be upset over our failure to reply. There is no personal relationship involved there, is there? The scenario is entirely different, however, if the piece of mail that we received four weeks ago is from a parent or from a grandparent. Ignoring their letters will certainly have some effect on the relationship. So, do you see the relationship here? Do you see the application to our walk with God? Too many of us hear the words of God and ignore them. We don't respond in any particular way to him. And when we wonder why there seems to be so much distance between us and God... The answer really is simple. His words to us demand and he deserve an appropriate response. They cannot be ignored or discarded as if they were just a piece of junk mail. And I'm afraid that's what too many believers do. They walk through the doors Sunday morning. They listen to a message from God's word. They listen to his words. They go home. And it's like discarded junk mail. Or maybe they even, on a daily basis, throughout the week, they open the Word, they read a chapter, but that's as far as it goes. It's discarded. It hasn't found the proper soil of a heart that is an ideal hearer. Are we treating God's Word like spiritual, spiritual junk mail? Jesus said, Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine is wise. Remember that from Matthew chapter 7 last week? You see, godliness is not the result of responding to Bible principles, but responding to a person. What you read in the Word of God is not simply words on a page. It is words from Almighty God, your Creator, your Redeemer. It is all about your relationship. And so the beginning of wisdom certainly entails giving attention, but that attention must be directed to God. The Christian life is not merely maintaining biblical rules, but maintaining a relationship with God as we have seen in previous chapters. Whom you listen to is the first issue to settle in gaining wisdom. And that's why Solomon said in Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning. It's the, it's the choicest part. It's the foundation of wisdom. A man who is not in his proper place of reverence for and submission to God cannot be wise. You and I can pray for wisdom from God. But if we are not in our proper place in our relationship with him, then we are wasting our breath. We cannot be wise. In that situation, we can listen only to our own sinful heart or to the sinful hearts of others and we'll become a greater fool. Adam was not created autonomous, was he? He was designed to listen to someone for direction in life. And that direction was to come from God as Adam fellowshiped with him in the garden. When he stopped listening to God and he listened instead to the serpent, the sinful desires of the serpent's own nature were implanted within him and that furnished him with a constant flow of information that was antagonistic to God. This is not a new theme to us. We, dis we discovered in previous chapters the sinful bent of man's heart. But it has important implications for us here. Because we can get wisdom from two places. And to be more specific, we can get two kinds of wisdom. 
fake wisdom, God's wisdom. If we are to move out of the foolishness of our own heart and develop a renewed mind, we must make it a habit of life, a discipline to listen to God rather than our own heart. Notice how often Proverbs directs the attention of the learner to God and to his elders. Proverbs 1.8, My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Chapter 1, verses 20 and 23, Wisdom crieth without, turn you at my reproof. Proverbs 2.1, My son, receive my words and hide my commandments with thee. Chapter 2, verse 6, The Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Next verse, verse 7 of chapter 2, He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. Chapter 3, verse 1, My son, forget not my law. Verse 5, Trust in the Lord. Verse 7, Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 1, Hear ye, children, the instruction of a father. Verse 10, Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings. Verse 20, My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Chapter 5, verse 1, My son, my son attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear to my understanding. Chapter 6, verse 20, My son, keep thy father's commandments. Forsake not the law of thy mother. Chapter 7, verse 1, My son, keep my words, and lay up my commandments with thee. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children. Attend to the words of my mouth. Verse 24. Chapter 8, verses 1 and 6. Doth not wisdom cry? Hear, for I will speak uh, of excellent things. Wisdom hath builded her house. She crieth, come eat of my bread. Forsake the foolish. That's chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Chapter 13, verse 1. A wise son heareth his father's instruction chapter 23 verse 19 hear thou my son and be wise so the list goes on and on but you get the point never in proverbs is a man advised to listen to his own heart or to the heart of his peers he is warned not to listen to seductive women not to listen to crowds and mobs to companions that are bent on being destructive and wasteful, he is not to listen to evil men. He is exhorted often to listen to his God and to his elders. And so we have to understand that the cornerstone of wisdom is a dependent and submissive heart that shows itself by giving its attention to God and to spiritual leaders, primarily godly parents and pastors. So we see this basic discipline of attention. Heeding, hearing the words of God. Let's talk secondly <clears throat> about the basic discipline of meditation. Meditation. Now remember, we're talking about the master discipline of hearing. And so we have these two basic disciplines that fall under that, attention and meditation. In addition to calling a man to listen to God, Proverbs exhorts the believer to retain the words of God and of his elders. The goal here is to think like God. The believers to make these words a permanent part of his life so that they actually direct his steps, preserve him from evil, make his life fruitful. And so we see throughout the book Solomon's exhortation toward this end. Chapter 1, verse 8. Forsake not the law of thy mother. Okay, we're looking at here at the, uh, at the verbs that, that he uses. Forsake not. Chapter 1, verse 8. Chapter 2, verse 2. Apply thine heart to understanding. Chapter 3, verse 1. My son, forget not my law. Verse 3. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. 
chapter 3, verse 21. My son, let not them depart from thine eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. Chapter 4, verse 2. Forsake ye not my law. Verse 4. Let thine heart retain my words. Verse 5. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Forget it not. Verse 6. Forsake her not. Verse 13. Take fast hold of instruction. 21. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Chapter 6, verse 21. Bind them continually upon thine heart. Tie them about thy neck. Chapter 7, verse 1. My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Verse 3. Bind them upon thy fingers. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Again, the list could go on and on. But these words from God must become so much a part of us that we do not forget them in the day-to-day -day activities of life. They can then dictate the right responses we must make to life's challenges. If we treat the word of God as Solomon has encouraged us to treat it in talking about wisdom, then we will have all that we need for right decisions and right responses in life. Let's talk about some things you just don't forget. <clears throat> Many believers will protest at this point as we talk about wisdom and remembering what God has said. That if we are talking about memorizing scripture, we must exempt them because they don't really have good memories. The truth of the matter is that anybody can remember anything that is important enough to them if they've rehearsed it enough times. Most people never forget their name, their phone number, the names of their children. They can remember these things because they have repeated them often enough and because these pieces of information have a high personal priority with them. If we illustrate this further, let's suppose that a boy beginning to date a girl in college finds out that she is allergic to daisies. That bit of information about her nature will become a governing principle for him. It dictates his actions toward her. If he wishes to show his affection through a gift of flowers, he will not do so with a bouquet of daisies. If he truly cares about protecting her from the uncomfortable reaction that she would have to daisies, and if he values his relationship with her, he will always remember to bring her something other than daisies. You see, there are some things that you just don't forget because of the importance of that person to you. You see, God is adverse, or we could say allergic, to some things too. His word teaches us what he loves and what he hates. And the psalmist David was very intent upon knowing God's nature so that he would not damage his relationship with God in any way. He understood that the laws and words of God are reflections of his nature. In order not to avoid, excuse me, in order not to violate the relationship, David was intent upon knowing God, knowing what he had said. Psalm 119 verses 4 through 16 shows us David's concern for the personal relationship which he had with God. And we see that concern for his relationship with God in the way he treated the scriptures. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments, I will keep thy statutes. O oh, forsake me not utterly. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. 
Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate in thy precepts, and I, I will have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. You see, much of the motivation to remember the words of God is tied to our relationship with him. If we view God's words like the words of our state state's highway department printed in a motor vehicle manual, we may have difficulty remembering or we may have a difficult time being motivated to remember them unless we are taking the driver's test soon. If we review if we view the words of God as the self revelation of one we love and one who loves us, then our motivation to know and to keep them increases dramatically. We want to know the one we love thinks so we want to know how the one we love thinks so that we can become like minded with him. We want to think like God. We cannot soon forget the words of one in whom we take delight. If the relationship with God drives our desire to know his words, then their mastery will be neither tedious nor burdensome. Without this relationship, though, the knowledge of the word becomes just an academic pursuit, just a tradition or a habit rather than an uh, or, or an exercise in duty driven self discipline the first chapter of james speaks to us about the approach of the word that keeps us from being from becoming a forgetful hearer let's talk about how to remember not to forget james chapter 1 and verse 19 tells us to be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. It's so easy when pressures mount for us to be quick to speak, quick to blow off steam, and very slow to listen to God. But Peter here, uh, Peter, who is James' co-pastor of the church in Jerusalem, had similar words for, for this particular congregation. He told them in times of trial, trial they must be diligent to gird up the loins of their mind. You see, pressured times are not the times to give in to sloppy thinking. Yet those who are yet yet those are the times when it is especially easy to forget what kind of next right response keeps us usable to Christ during the trial. In the following verses, after admonishing his readers to be swift to hear, James outlined for them the, the procedures to master the word, or rather to let it master them. And here are his words, James 1, 21 through 25. Wherefore, lay apart, in other words, put aside all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Now that phrase there means all that remains of wickedness. And he says then to receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass or a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and then goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Don't be that kind of hearer, James says. He says, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. The last verse in this section tells us 
how to avoid being forgetful here. It says that if we are to look into the perfect law of liberty, which, which refers to the word itself, it is the liberating truth which shall make you free. The word looketh is the operative word in this passage. It means to bend over, to see something better. Let's illustrate this. Perhaps you've been around someone who has lost a contact lens on the carpet. If you have, you can understand the force of this word. There your friend is on all fours, his eyeballs only inches from the floor, scanning the carpet. He is peering intently at the carpet, systematically covering a section at a, at a time, trying to catch a glimpse of his lens. He's careful to ward off others who would come near the search site lest they step on his contact. Because he has one goal, to find that contact lens. So this is no casual haphazard glance at the floor from a standing position. This word communicates the kind of single-minded systematic search for something valuable that has us bending over in order to see better. This illustrates as well the force of Proverbs 2, when Solomon lays out the normal means of getting wisdom. Incline thine ear unto wisdom, apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge, and understanding. So notice again the intensity and the single-mindedness about this search. This is what is involved in biblical meditation. Meditation is not hard to understand. Anyone who knows how to worry knows how to meditate. We all know how to worry, right? comes pretty natural. We're good at worrying. A worrier takes one thought. Okay, It could be something like, I just know I'll never get married. Uh, I'm afraid my husband will leave me. Or, we don't have any money left. How am I going to pay the bills? A worrier takes that one thought and look single-mindedly at every thought from every possible angle, examining every possible implication and application of that thought to them personally. Warriors are skilled in the meditation process, but are meditating on the wrong kinds of thoughts. So let's talk about biblical meditation, because it involves the same process as, as worrying. The only difference is that you're Thoughts are focused on the right things rather than the wrong things. In biblical meditation, the reflective thought must be on the truth of God and not a lie from our own heart or from Satan. We have to start with truth that's revealed to us from the word and then examine it from every possible angle, asking God to show us its implications and its applications for us and our relationship with him. We will be bending over to see it better. For some people, that will mean looking up the, word, the verses in commentaries or studying the individual words in Bible dictionaries or word studies. It may mean looking up cross-references to other passages in Scripture that shed more light on the passage being studied. For some who know Greek or Hebrew, it will mean examining the words in their original languages. But above all, it will mean an ongoing interaction with God himself asking him to reveal to us the truth he wants to know and practice so that our fellowship with him can increase and our, few, and our fruitfulness for him can increase and grow. He will most often respond to us by first convicting us of unconfessed sin. Because remember that David said, the entrance of thy words giveth light. And that light is going to expose our sin. Notice the sequence in Proverbs 123. 
turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. So remember that the, the aim of this meditation process is to help us behold our God and think like our God so that we can know and therefore do those things that are pleasing in his sight. 1 John 3, 22. The barriers that hinder our fellowship with God have to be removed before he will reveal his words to us. Now, this kind of reflection or meditation, as we're calling it, does not necessarily follow the same pattern for every believer. Um, you can gain some ideas for your own med meditation by reviewing some of the different portions of the book that we've already been through. There's some helps and appendices at the back of the book as well. Um, so you can take a look at those uh, to help you uh, uh, develop a pattern or a process for meditating upon the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is most important in the process though, so don't forget uh, don't forget to ask him for his illumination. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Now, in closing here, the passage in James 1 that exhorts us to look into the perfect law of liberty says also that we are to be continuing in it. And so the question, next question might be, how long do we continue peering intently into the word? Well, the twofold answer is found in the next phrase of the verse. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. And so here's the idea here. We are to continue in the word of God as long as it takes to make sure we do not forget <clears throat> what we have heard. This may mean meditating on the same passage, studying it, reflecting on it for several weeks. Now that certainly doesn't mean we can't read other passages or keep up with a a Bible reading schedule, but it does mean that our focused attention must continually come back to the passage at hand until it becomes a permanent part of our thinking. It's not as impossible as it seems, right? The Holy Spirit is our teacher. He wants to teach the Word to us. And so He's going to do that. He's going to aid in our understanding of it. He's going to aid in our uh, uh, absorbing of it, and that whole meditation process, the Holy Spirit is going to be our guide. In addition, the constant repetition and concentration of the meditation process is going to firmly entrench God's words in our heart. So the first indication of the thoroughness of our meditation is when we have continued long enough that it that, that, we, that we don't forget what we heard. The second one here is that we are to continue as long as it takes to actually begin to show a difference in our lifestyle and practice. This is how Paul described it to Timothy. 1 Timothy 4, 15 and 16. He says, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto thy doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3, David here testifies of the fruitfulness and the stability that meditation will produce in the life of a believer who continually reflects on God's words. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that giveth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And so this is the first discipline of wisdom, hearing the word of God. We must choose to listen to God instead of our own heart or instead of to, to others who listen to their own heart. In addition, we must choose to think like God. This reflective time that we spend 
is going to yield a lasting like-mindedness that increases our affection for God and controls our decisions. We will know the next right response in any given circumstance because we are beginning to have a renewed mind, the mind of Christ. And so I trust that I trust that that helps helps you understand uh, how we can develop and how God God can develop within our uh, minds a, a renewed way of thinking, how we can think like God. You say, but I thought God's thoughts are above our thoughts and his ways above our ways. Yes, uh, this is true. Uh, however, God has given us a book of knowledge, a book of understanding, and he has promised that his Holy Spirit will guide us into truth. But sadly, too often we treat it like junk mail. We treat it like spam mail in our inbox. We move it over to the spam folder, the junk folder, never to see it again. Now you say, well, I would never do that. I'd never put my Bible on the shelf, never to pick it up again. But what about its truths? Are you seeking them as for hid treasure? Do you meditate upon the word of God? Folks, I, I, I feel, I, I believe that this is uh, a discipline that we are severely lacking in. Meditating upon the word of God. Not just reading a passage, not just hearing it preached, and then forgetting, but sincerely letting God let that word ruminate within our hearts and minds. And so I trust that this chapter has been a challenge uh, to you. And as I referred to, uh, go to some of the helps. Now, if you have the book, um, on one of the last pages of the chapter, uh, there, 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 there are some specific sections of this book that he refers to to give you some helps to, uh, to begin a process of biblical meditation. I trust that you'll take that if, 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 if you need help in that area. And uh, you could certainly reach out to me, ask me any questions that, uh, that you'd like, and um, I'd be glad to help you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your for your goodness. Father, you are uh, just a loving God to want a relationship with us. And Lord, what an incredible and amazing thing that is that we can walk with you. But sadly, we take little advantage of that. The soil of our heart is, Lord, either not very deep or it's crowded with all kinds of other things. The Lord is just hard. But I pray that you would break up, as the prophet said, the fallow ground. Change our hearts. Soften them. Stir them up. Make them tender. Lord, as is needed, bring us to brokenness. That a spiritual healing process can begin. Show us where we need to be broken, oh God. That we might be real, sincere hearers and doers of the word. We thank you for what you'll do with these truths in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.